C News Special Report, The Trial of Donald J. Trump. Here is Lester Holt. Hello, everyone. It's 1 o'clock in the East. We're coming on the air to bring you live coverage of the Senate impeachment trial of President Trump today, the third and final day for the defense to spell out why the president should not be removed from office. The president's lawyer is hoping to wrap up this trial quickly. I've said little publicly so far about what may be a game changer in the question of calling new witnesses. I'm speaking, of course, of those explosive allegations by former National Security Advisor John Bolton, who says in a still unpublished book manuscript that the president directly tied release of aid to Ukraine to a promise from them to investigate Joe Biden. That contradicts what the president has said all along. We'll hear and see if we hear more on that today. Let's go right to Casey Hunt on Capitol Hill. Casey, how are we doing now on this question of whether this trial could be extended? Well, Lester, there is a remarkable amount of uncertainty at this point about how Republicans are going to proceed. We know that they're planning to meet later this afternoon to try and address this topic. You've had Mitt Romney, the senator from Utah, come out uh, even more strongly uh, today in repeating that he would still like to hear from witnesses and raising the possibility that there may be some sort of deal struck here, that uh, they may try to trade uh, a witness that Republicans are interested in hearing from uh, for a witness for the Democrats. Now, what we don't know is whether such a deal has the four votes that it would take for this to actually play out on the Senate floor, to open everything up to witnesses. That is a remarkable reality considering where we were just 48 hours ago uh, as this John Bolton uh, New York Times scoop was breaking about the contents of his book. The conversation has really just shifted dramatically. And as you pointed out, the Republican or the president's defense, they barely mentioned Bolton uh, yesterday. We're expecting them to wrap up their arguments today. Uh, one question I've heard from Republican sources is uh, whether there are questions that senators, especially Republican senators need answered uh, from the White House team as they try uh, to make this decision. So uh, still uh, so much at stake here. What was expected to potentially wrap up uh, by the end of the week before, of course, the president delivers his expected State of the Union next week. Uh, now a very real possibility that it extends for weeks after that, Lester. All right, Casey, thank you. I want to go to the White House now. Kristen Welker is standing by. How's all this playing out at the White House, Kristen? Well, Lester, President Trump engaged in a bit of counter-programming at this hour. He is standing with the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, laying out his plan for Middle East peace. Now, it includes remapping the West Bank and Jerusalem, a path to statehood for Palestinians. Worth noting, Palestinians are not a part of this plan. In fact, they are expected to reject it outright. But of course, all of this comes as he is facing yet another day of this impeachment trial and as the White House is trying to figure out how to deal with those explosive new allegations by former National Security Advisor John Bolton, as Casey and you have been mentioning, his legal team didn't mention it a whole lot yesterday, but Alan Dershowitz did have something to say. He said, look, even if everything that John Bolton has said is true, it's still not impeachable. So that's going to be the argument from the legal team. Take a listen. Nothing in the Bolton revelations, even if true, would rise to the level of an abuse of power or an impeachable offense. And at this hour, Lester, another potential problem for the White House, the former chief of staff here, John Kelly, at an event saying, I believe John Bolton. Now, administration officials already trying to downplay those comments, but it is yet one more data point that could add credibility to John Bolton and this debate over whether to call witnesses. Lester. Kristen Welker, thank you. With me here are senior Washington correspondent Andrea Mitchell and NBC News legal analyst and former federal prosecutor Barrett uh, Berger. I, I want to talk about what Dershowitz apparently said yesterday, what, 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 he, what he said yesterday. This is the, the president did nothing wrong defense, that even, even if you prove what you say, it's no foul. How, does, how is that playing, Barrett? My first reaction is he's saying this without actually knowing everything that John Bolton would say. We haven't heard from John Bolton. We've had reports of what this manuscript says, but until John Bolton has been on a witness stand and testified completely, it's impossible for anyone to say that what he would say would not rise to the level of an impeachable offense. So I think he is definitely putting the cart before the horse here and the, the true course of action to the Constitution and to the principles of what we expect in trials is 
to hear for the witness first. And then Andrea, John Kelly backing up, backing up a Bolton statement. How powerful is that? That is powerful, but what really was powerful, of course, is Bolton, because Bolton was there most recently. Kelly has been gone for a while, and uh, Bolton is the person who was there when the Ukraine, the, the heart of all of this, was being you know, dealt with when he talked to the president. Bolton's testimony is so critical, and even more critical because of the way the defense lawyers laid this, their defense out yesterday, saying that it's hearsay, it's no one really knows, you know, we don't have firsthand accounts, it's not an abuse of power. That argues for witnesses. So they were, in essence, by default making the case for witnesses, it's going to be increasingly difficult for the Republicans to reject it. All right, well, the president's lawyers are ab about to be back at it again. This is their last chance to make their case. Uh, not necessarily the last chance, but they're, they're, they're end of their three-day period to make their case. Let's take you to the Senate floor. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons are commanded to keep silent on pain of imprisonment, while the Senate of the United States is sitting for the trial of the Articles of Impeachment exhibited by the House of Representatives against Donald John Trump, President of the United States. Mr. Chief Justice. The majority leader is recognized. We expect several hours uh, of session today with probably one quick break in the middle. Thank you. Pursuant to the provisions of Senate Resolution 483, the counsel for the president have 15 hours and 33 minutes remaining to make the presentation of their case, though it will not be possible to use the remainder of that time before the end of the day. The Senate will now hear you. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate. Just to give you a very quick, brief overview of today, we do not intend to use much of that time today, Mr. Chief Justice. We intend to be, our goal is to be finished by dinner time and well before. We'll have three presentations. First will be Pat Philbin, Deputy White House Counsel. Then Jay Sekulow will give a presentation. We'll take a break if that's okay with you, Mr. Leader, and then after that, I'll finish with a presentation. So that's our, our goal for the day. And with that, I'll turn it over to Pat Philbin. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, Majority Leader McConnell, Minority Leader Schumer, I'd like to start today by making a couple of observations related to the abuse of power charge in the first article of impeachment. And I, I wouldn't presume to elaborate on Professor Dershowitz's presentation from yesterday evening, which I thought was complete and compelling, but I wanted to just add a couple of very specific points in support of the exposition of the Constitution and the impeachment clause that he set out. And it begins from a focus on the point in the debate about the impeachment clause at the Constitutional Convention where maladministration was offered by George Mason as a grounds for impeachment. And James Madison responded that that was a bad idea. And he said, so vague a term will be equivalent to a tenure during the pleasure of the Senate. And that evinced a deep-seated concern that Madison had, and it's part of the whole design of our Constitution, for ways that can lead to exercises of arbitrary power. The Constitution was designed to put limits and checks on all forms of government power. Obviously, one of the great mechanisms for that is the separation of powers, the structural separation of powers in our Constitution. But it also comes from defining and limiting powers and responsibilities and a concern that vague terms, vague standards are themselves an opportunity for the expansion of power and the exercise of arbitrary power. And we see that throughout the Constitution and in the impeachment clause as well. And this is why, as Governor Morris argued in discussing the impeachment clause, that only few offenses, he said few offenses, ought to be impeachable and the cases ought to be enumerated and defined. And that's why we see in the debates at the Constitution, there was a, many terms had been included in earlier drafts when it was narrowed down to treason and bribery, and there was a suggestion to include maladministration, 
which had been a ground for impeachment in English practice, the framers rejected it because it was too vague. It was too expansive. It would allow for arbitrary exercises of power. And we see throughout the Constitution in terms that relate and fit in with the impeachment clause the same concern. One is in the definition of treason. The framers were very concerned that the English practice of having a vague concept of treason that was malleable and could be changed even after the fact to define new concepts of treason was dangerous. It was one of the things that they wanted to reject from the English system. So they defined in the Constitution very specifically what constituted treason and how it had to be proved. And then that term was incorporated into the impeachment clause. Similarly, in the rejection of maladministration, which had been an impeachable offense in England, the framers rejected that because it was vague. A vague standard, something that's too changeable, that can be redefined, can be malleable after the fact, allows for the arbitrary exercise of power. And that would be dangerous to give that power to the legislature as a power to impeach the executive. And similarly, and it relates again to the impeachment clause, one of the greatest dangers from having changeable standards that existed in the English system was bills of attainder. Under a bill of attainder, the parliament could pass a specific law saying that a specific person had done something unlawful, they were being attainted, even though it wasn't unlawful before that. And the framers rejected that entire concept. In Article 1, Section 9, they eliminated both bills of attainder and all ex post facto laws for criminal penalties at the federal level, and they also included a provision to prohibit states from using bills of attainder. Now, in the English system, there was a, a relationship to some extent between impeachment and bills of attainder because both were tools of the parliament to get at officials in the government. You could impeach them for an established offense, or you could pass a, a bill of attainder. And it was because the definition of impeachment was being narrowed that George Mason at the debate suggested. And he pointed out, in the English system, there's a bill of attainder. It's been a great, useful tool for the government. But we're eliminating that, and now we're getting a narrow definition of impeachment. We ought to expand it to include maladministration. And Madison said no, and the framers agreed, we have to have enumerated and defined offenses, not a vague concept, not something that can be blurry and interpreted after the fact, and that could be used essentially to make policy differences or other differences like that the subject of impeachment. All of the steps that the framers took in the way they approached the impeachment clause were in terms of narrowing, restricting, constraining, enumerating offenses, and not a vague and malleable approach as there had been in the English system. And I think the minority views of um, Republican members of the House Judiciary Committee at the time of the Nixon impeachment inquiry summed this up and reflected it well, because they explained, and I'm quoting from the minority views in the report, the whole tenor of the framers' discussions, the whole purpose of their many careful departures from English impeachment practice was in the direction of limits and of standards. An impeachment power exercised without extrinsic and objective standards would be tantamount to the use of bills of attainder and ex post facto laws, which are expressly forbidden by the Constitution and are contrary to the American spirit of justice. And what we see in the House managers' charges and their definition of abuse of power is exactly antithetical to the framers' approach because their very premise for their abuse of power charge is that it is entirely based on subjective motive, not objective standards, not predefined offenses, but the president can do something that is perfectly lawful, perfectly within his authority, but if the real reason, as Professor Dershowitz pointed out, that's the language from their report, the reason in the president's mind is something that they ferret out and decide is wrong, that becomes impeachable. And that's exact, that's not a standard at all. It ends up being infinitely malleable. And it's something that I think, a telling factor that reflects how malleable it is and how dangerous it is, is in the House Judiciary Committee's report. 
Because after they define their concept of abuse of power, and they say that it involves your exercising government power for personal interest and not the national interest, and it depends on your subjective motives, they realize that that's infinitely malleable. There's not really a clear standard there. And it's violating a fundamental premise of the American system of justice that you have to have notice of what is wrong. You have to have notice of an offense. And this is something that Professor Dershowitz pointed out last night. There has to be a defined offense in advance. And the way they try to resolve this is to say, well, in addition to our definition, high crimes and misdemeanors involve conduct that is recognizably wrong to a reasonable person. And that's their kind of add-on to deal with the fact that they have an unconstitutionally vague standard. They don't have a standard that really defines a specific offense. They don't have a standard that really defines in coherent terms that are going to be identifiable what the offenses are. So they just add on, and it's got to be recognizably wrong. And they say that they're doing this to resolve a tension, they call it, within the Constitution. Because they point out, and this is quoting from the report, the structure of the Constitution, including its prohibition on bills of attainder and the ex post facto clause, implies that impeachable offenses should not come as a surprise. And that's exactly what Professor Dershowitz pointed out. And everything about the terms of the Constitution, speaking of an offense and a conviction, that it's all crimes should be tried by jury except impeachments, they all talk about impeachment in those criminal offense terms. But the tension here isn't within the Constitution. It's between the House manager's definition, which lacks any coherent definition of an offense that would catch people by surprise, and the Constitution. That's the tension that they're trying to resolve, is between their malleable standard that actually states no clear offense and the Constitution and the principles of justice embodied in the Constitution that require some clear offense. So I wanted to point that out in relation to the standards for impeachable offenses, because it's a, another piece of the constitutional puzzle that fits in with the exposition that Professor Dershowitz set out. And it also shows an inherent flaw in the House manager's theory of abuse of power, regardless of whether or not one accepts the view that an impeachable offense has to be a crime, a defined crime. There is still the flaw in their definition of abuse of power that it is so malleable, based on purely subjective standards, that it does not provide any cognizable notice of an offense. It is so malleable, it in effect recreates the offense of maladministration that the framers expressly rejected, as Professor Dershowitz explained. The second point that I wanted to make is that how do we tell under the house manager's standard what an illicit motive is, when there's an illicit motive? How are we supposed to get the proof of what's inside the president's head? Because of course, motive is inherently difficult to prove where you're talking about, as they've conceded, they're talking about perfectly lawful actions on their face within the constitutional authority of the president but they want to make it impeachable if it's just the wrong idea inside the president's head. And they explain in the House Judiciary Committee report that the way we'll tell if the president had the wrong motive is we'll compare what he did to what staffers in the executive branch said he ought to do. So they say, quote, that the president, quote, disregarded United States foreign policy towards Ukraine end quote, and that he ignored, quote, unquote, official policy that he had been briefed on, and that he, quote, ignored, defied, and confounded every agency within the executive branch, end quote. That is not a constitutionally coherent statement. The president cannot defy agencies within the executive branch. Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution vests all of the executive power in a president of the United States. He alone is an entire branch of government. He sets policy for the executive branch. He's given vast power. And of course, within limits set by laws passed by Congress, 
and within limits set by spending priorities, spending laws passed by Congress, he, within those constraints, sets the policies of the government. And in areas of foreign affairs, military affairs, national security, which is what we're dealing with in this case, foreign affairs, head of state communications, he has vast powers, as Professor Dershowitz explained, for over two centuries, the president has been regarded as the sole organ of the nation in foreign affairs. So the idea that we're going to find out when the president had the wrong subjective motives by comparing what he did to the recommendations of some interagency consensus among staffers is fundamentally anti-constitutional. It inverts the constitutional structure. And it's also fundamentally anti-democratic because our system is rather unique in the amount of power that it gives to the president. The executive here has more, much more power than in a parliamentary system. But part of the reason that the president can have that power is that he is directly democratically accountable to the people. There is an election every four years to ensure that the president stays democratically accountable to the people. But those staffers in these supposed interagency who have their meetings and make recommendations to the president are not accountable to the people. There is no democratic legitimacy or accountability to their decisions or recommendations. And that is why it is the president, as head of the executive branch, who has the authority to actually set policies and make determinations, regardless of what the staffers may recommend. They're there to provide information and recommendations, not to set policy. So the idea that we're going to start impeaching presidents by deciding that they have illicit motives if we can show that they disagreed with some interagency consensus is fundamentally contrary to the Constitution and fundamentally anti-democratic. So those were the two observations I wanted to add to supplement specific points on Professor Dershowitz's comments from last night. Now I want to shift gears and respond to a couple of points that the House managers have brought up that are really completely extraneous to this proceeding. They involve matters that are not charged in the articles of impeachment. They do not direct, relate, direct, rela excuse me, relate directly to the president or his actions. But they are accusations that were brought up somewhat recklessly in any event, and we cannot close without some response to them. And the first has to do with the idea that somehow the White House and, and White House lawyers were involved in some sort of cover-up related to the transcript of the July 25th call because it was stored on a, a highly classified system. So let me start with that. The House managers made this accusation there was something nefarious going on. But let's see what the witnesses actually had to say. Lieutenant Col Colonel Alexander Vindman, and remember, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman is the person who was listening in on the call and who raised a concern, the only person who went and raised a concern with NSC lawyers that he, saw, he thought there was something improper, something wrong with the call. Even though he later conceded under cross-examination it was really a policy concern, but he thought there was something wrong. And he had to say that he did not think, he said, so I do not think there was malicious intent or anything of that nature to cover anything up. He's the one who went and talked to the lawyers. He's the one whose complaint spurred the idea that, wait, there might be something that's really sensitive here. We should make sure that this is not going to leak. He thought there was nothing covering it up. His boss, Senior Director Tim Morrison, had similar testimony. So to the best of your knowledge, there's no malicious intent in, in moving the transcript to the compartment and server? Correct. And the idea that there was some sort of cover-up is further destroyed by the simple fact that everyone who as part of their jobs needed access to that transcript still had access to it, including Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. Right? So the person who raises a complaint still has access to the transcript the entire time. And this is the way uh, Mr. Morrison's testimony explained that. And, and even on the code word server, you had access to it? Yes. Um, 
So, so at no point in time during the course of your official duties were you, were you denied uh, access to this information? Correct. Is that correct? Um, and to your knowledge, anybody on the NSC staff that needed access to the transcript for their official duties uh, always was able to, to access it, correct? People that had a need to know and a need to access it. Once it was moved to the compartment system? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, as Mr. Morrison testified, he had recommended restricting access to the transcript, not because he had any concern that there was anything improper or illegal, but he was concerned about a potential leak. And as he put it, how that, quote, would play out in Washington's polarized environment, end quote, and would, quote, affect the bipartisan support our Ukrainian partners currently experience in Congress. And he was right to be concerned, potentially, about leaks, because the Trump administration has fast faced national security leaks at an alarming rate. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman himself said that concerns about leaks seemed justified, and it was not unusual that something would be put in a more restric restricted circulation. Now, what else is in the record evidence? Mr. Morrison explained his understanding of how the transcript ended up on that server. I spoke with the NSC Executive Secretariat staff, asked them why, and they uh, did their research and they informed me it had been moved to the higher classification system at the direction of um, John Eisenberg, whom I then asked why. I mean, that's, if that was the judgment he made, that's not necessarily mine to question, but I didn't understand it, and he, he essentially told me, I, I gave no such direction. He did his own inquiry, and he represented back to me that it was, his understanding was that it was a, a kind of administrative error that when he also gave direction to restrict access, the executive secretary staff understood that as uh, a, a, an apprehension that there was something um, in the content of the MemCon that could not exist on the lower classification system. Um, so to the best of your knowledge, there's no malicious intent in, in moving the transcript to the compartment and server? Correct. Everyone who knew something about it and who testified agreed there was no malicious intent. The call was still available to everyone who needed it as part of their job, and it certainly wasn't covered up or deep-sixed in some way. The president declassified it and made it public. So why we're even here talking about these accusations about a cover-up when it's a transcript that was preserved and made public is somewhat absurd. Now, the other point I'd like to turn to, another accusation from the House managers, is that the whistleblower complaint, when the whistleblower complaint was not forwarded to Congress, they've said that lawyers at the Department of Justice this time, they accuse OLC, the Office of Legal Counsel, of providing a bogus opinion for why the Director of National Intelligence did not have to advance uh, the whistleblower's complaint to Congress. And Manager Jeffries said that OLC opined, quote, without any reasonable basis that the acting DNI did not have to turn over the complaint to Congress, end quote. And the way he portrayed this, now there's a statute it says if the I, Inspector General of the Intelligence Community finds a matter of urgent concern, it must, be, it must be forwarded to Congress. And Manager Jeffries portrayed this as if the only thing to decide was were these claims urgent. He said, quote, what could be more urgent than a sitting president's trying to cheat in an American election by soliciting foreign interference? That's not the only question. The statute doesn't just say if it's urgent, you have to forward it. It talks about urgent concern as a defined term. Now, if the House managers want to come and cast accusations at the political and career officials at the Office of Legal Counsel, which we all know is a very respected office of the Department of Justice, provides opinions for the executive branch on what governing law is, they should come backed up with analysis. So let's look at what the law actually says. And I think we have the slide of that. Urgent concern is defined as a serious or flagrant problem, abuse, violation of law, 
relating to the funding, administration, or operation of an intelligence activity within the responsibility and authority of the Director of National Intelligence involving classified information. So the Office of Legal Counsel was consulted by the General Counsel at the DNI's office, and they looked at this definition, and they did an analysis, and they determined that the alleged misconduct is not an urgent concern within the meaning of the statute. Because they're not just talking about, do we think it's urgent? Do we think it's important? No, they're analyzing the law. And they looked at the terms of the statute. The alleged misconduct is not an urgent concern within the meaning of the statute because it does not concern the funding, administration, or operation of an intelligence activity under the authority of the DNI. Remember, what we're talking about here is a head of state communication between the President of the United States and another head of state. This isn't some CIA operation overseas. This isn't the NSA doing something. This isn't any intelligence activity going on within the intelligence community under the supervision of the DNI. It's the head of the executive branch exercising his constitutional authority engaging in foreign relations with a foreign head of state. So in reaching that conclusion, the Office of Legal Counsel looked at the statute, the case law, the legislative history, and it concluded that this phrase of urgent concern includes matters relating to intelligence activities subject to the DNI's supervision, but it does not include allegations of wrongdoing arising outside of any intelligence activity or outside the intelligence community itself, and that makes sense. This statute was meant to provide for an ability of the Inspector General of the intelligence community, overseeing the activities of the intelligence community, to receive reports about what was going on at intelligence agencies, those that are members of the intelligence community, if there was fraud, waste, abuse, something unlawful in those activities. It was not meant to create an Inspector General of the presidency, an inspector general of the Oval Office, to purport to determine whether the president, in exercising his constitutional authorities, had done something that should be reported. This law is narrow, and it does not cover every alleged violation of law, OLC explained, or other abuse that comes to the attention of a member of the intelligence community. Just because you're in the intelligence community and happen to see something else, doesn't make this law apply. And the law does not make the Inspector General for the intelligence community responsible for investigating and reporting on allegations that do not involve intelligence activities or the intelligence community. Now, nonetheless, the President, of course, released the July 25th call transcript. And it was also not the end of the matter that the whistleblower complaints and the, the, DNI, uh, the ICIG's letter were not sent directly to Congress. Because OLC explained that if the complaint does not involve an urgent concern, but if there's anything else there that you want to have checked out, the appropriate action is to refer the matter to the Department of Justice. And that's what the DNI's office did. They sent the ICIG's letter with the complaint to the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice looked at it. And this was all made public some time ago. The Department of Justice examined the exact allegations of the whistleblower and the exact framing and concern raised by the Inspector General, which had to do with a potential of perhaps a campaign finance law violation. DOJ looked at it, looked at the statutes, analyzed it, and determined there was no violation and it closed the matter, and it announced that months ago. All right, when something gets sent over to the Department of Justice to examine, you can't call that a cover-up. Everything here was done correctly. The lawyers analyzed the law. The complaint was sent to the appropriate person for review. It was not within the statute that required transmission to Congress. And everything was handled entirely properly. So again, actually extraneous, to the matters before you, 
There's nothing about this, these two points in the articles of impeachment, but it merits a response when reckless allegations are made against those at the White House and at the Department of Justice. And with that, Mr. Chief Justice, I'll yield back my time to Mr. Sekulow. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, Majority Leader McConnell, Democratic Leader Schumer, House Managers, members of the Senate. What we are involved in here, as we conclude, is perhaps the most solemn of duties under our constitutional framework. The trial of the leader of the free world and the duly elected President of the United States. It is not a game of leaks and unsourced manuscripts. That's politics, unfortunately, and Hamilton put impeachment in the hands of this body, the Senate, precisely and specifically to be above that fray. This is the greatest deliberative body on earth. In our presentation so far, you've now heard from legal scholars from a variety of schools of thought from a variety of political backgrounds. But they do have a common theme with a dire warning, danger, danger, danger. To lower the bar of impeachment based on these articles of impeachment would impact the functioning of our constitutional republic and the framework of that constitution for generations. I asked you um, to put yourself in, quoting um, Mr. Schiff's, Manager Schiff's statement his father made about putting yourselves in the shoes of someone else, and I, I said, I'd like you to put your shoes, your, yourself in the shoes of the President. And I think it's important as we conclude today that we're reminded of that fact. The President of the United States, before he was the President, was under an investigation. It was called Crossfire Hurricane. It was an investigation led by the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. James Comey eventually told the President a little bit about the investigation and referenced the Steele dossier. James Comey, the then director of the FBI, said it was salacious and unverified. So salacious and unverified that they used it as a basis to obtain FISA warrants. Members, managers here, managers at this table right here, said that any discussions on the abuse from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act utilized to get the FISA warrants from the court were conspiracy theories. I told you at the very beginning, I asked do you put yourselves in the shoes of not just this president, of any president that would have been under this type of attack? FISA warrants issued on people affiliated with his campaign, American citizens affiliated with people of his campaign, citizens of the United States being surveilled pursuant to an order that has now been acknowledged by the very court that issued the order that it was based on a fraudulent presentation. In fact, evidence specifically changed. Changed by the very FBI lawyer who was in charge of this. Changed to such an extent 
that the Foreign Surveillance Intelligence Court, as I said earlier, I'm not going to repeat it again, issued two orders saying that when this agent, this lawyer, made these misrepresentations to the National Security Division, they also made a misrepresentation to a federal court, the federal court, the Foreign Surveillance Court, a court where there are no defense witnesses, a court where there are, is no cross-examination. It's a court based on trust. That trust was violated. And then the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, James Comey, decides he will leak a memo of a conversation he had with the President of the United States. And he is leaking the memo for a purpose, he said, to obtain the appointment of a special counsel. And lo and behold, a special counsel was appointed. And it just so happens that that FBI agent, lawyer, who committed the fraud on the FISA court became a lawyer for the Mueller investigation, only to be removed because of political animus and bias found by the Inspector General. Then we have a special counsel investigation. Lisa Page, Agent Strzok, I'm not going to go into the details. You know them. They're not in controversy, they're uncontroverted. The facts are clear. But does it bother your sense of justice even a little bit, even a little bit, that Bob Mueller allowed the evidence on the phones of those agents to be wiped clean while there was an investigation going on by the Inspector General. Now, if you did it, if you did it, Manager Schiff, if you did it, Manager Jeffries, if I did that, destroyed evidence, if anyone in this chamber did this, we'd be in serious trouble. Their serious trouble is they get fired. Bob Mueller's explanation for it is, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I can't recall the conversations. You can't view this case in a vacuum. You are being asked, and I say this with the utmost respect, you are being asked to remove an elected, duly elected president of the United States. This isn't some, we had references to law school exams, and I loved the fact that I thought there was, were great analysis yesterday, and I appreciate all of that, but I want to focus today, or my section, on what you're being asked to do. You are being asked to remove a duly elected president of the United States, and you're being asked to do it in an election year. In an election year. There are some of you in this chamber right now that would rather be someplace else. And that's why we'll be brief. I understand. You'd rather be someplace else. Why would you rather be someplace else? Because you're running for president, the nomination of your party. I get it. But this is a serious deliberative situation. You're being asked to remove a duly elected president of the United States. That's what the articles of impeachment call for removal. So we had a special counsel. And we got the report. And just for a moment, putting yourselves in the shoes of this president or any president that would be under this situation, you're number four at the Department of Justice. His wife is working for the firm that's doing the opposition research on him and is communicating with the foreign former spy, Christopher Steele, to put together the dossier and it's being handled 
by Christopher Steele through Nellie Orr to her husband, then the fourth ranking member at the Department of Justice, Bruce Orr, and all of this is going on. And he doesn't want to tell, and he's testified to this, he doesn't want to tell everybody what he's doing because he's afraid he might have to stop. Might have to stop. How did this happen? This is the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And then we ask, why is the president concerned about advice he's being given? Put yourself in his shoes. Put yourself in his shoes. We've given you, and our approach has been, to give an overview and to be very specific. To remove a duly elected president, which is what you're being asked to do, for in essentially policy disagreements. You heard a lot about policy. Although the one that I still, I, I, it still troubles me. I, this idea that the president, it was said by several of the managers, is only doing these things for himself. Understanding what is going on in the world today as we're here. They raised it, by the way. I'm not, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm, they raised it. This president is only doing things for himself while the leaders of opposing parties, by the way, at the highest level, to obtain peace in the Middle East, to say you're only doing that for yourself. I think the irony of that, that those statements were made while all of that was going on and, and other acts that this body's passed, some of it bipartisan, to help the American people. Policy differences. Those policy differences cannot be utilized to destroy the separation of powers. House managers spoke for, I know we've had disagreements on the time, if it was 21 hours or 23 hours, they spoke during their time, a lot of time. Most of it attacking the president, policy decisions. They didn't like what they heard. They didn't like there was a pause on foreign aid. I laid out before that there was pauses on all kinds of foreign aid. It's not the first president to do it. But the one thing I, I'm still trying to understand from the manager's perspective, and maybe it's not fair to ask the managers because you're not the, you're not the leader of the, of the house, but remember the whole idea that this was a dire national security threat, a danger to our nation? We had to get this over here right away. It had to be done before Christmas. It was so important, it was so significant. The country was in such jeopardy. The jeopardy was so serious that it had to be done immediately. Let's hold on to the articles of impeachment for a month to see if the House could force the Senate to adopt rules that they wanted, which is not the way the Constitution is set up. But it was such a dire emergency. It was so critical for our nation's national interest that we could hold them for 33 days. Danger, danger, danger. That's politics. As I said, you're being called upon to, to remove the duly elected president of the United States. That's what these articles of impeachment call for. They never really answer the question of why they thought there was such a national emergency. Maybe they will during questions, I don't know. There was such a national emergency, they never did explain why it was that they waited. They certainly didn't wait to have the proceedings as my colleagues have laid out. I mean, those proceedings it moved in record time. I suspect that we've been here more than the, the, the House actually considered the actual articles of impeachment. Is that the way the Constitution is supposed to work? Is that the design of the Constitution? And then the question, of course, came up in, and yesterday on the whole situation with Burisma and the Bidens and that whole issue. And my colleagues went through that a great deal, and I'm not going to do that. But do, do, do we have a, like, are we in a situation, we used to call this, in free speech cases, like a, a free speech zone. 
You could have your free speech activities over here. You can't have them over there. Do we have like a, a Biden free zone? I mean, was that what this was? That, that was, it, it's, it's a, you, you mentioned someone or you're concerned about a company and it's now off limits. You can impeach your president of the United States for asking a question. I think we significantly showed the question. I'm not going to go through a detail by detail analysis of the facts. But there are some that we just have to go through. You heard a lot of new facts yesterday in our presentation. Uh, Saturday, what we were pointing to is a very quick overview. And then yesterday, we spent the day, and we appreciate everybody's patience on that, going through the facts. They showed you this, but they didn't show you that. The facts are important, though, because facts have legal ramifications. Legal ramifications impact the decisions you make. So I don't take facts lightly, and I certainly don't take the constitutional mandate lightly, and we can't. The facts we demonstrated yesterday and on, briefly on Saturday demonstrate that there was, in fact, a proper governmental interest in the questions that the President asked and the issues that the President raised on that phone call. A phone call, now let's, again, put your shoes in the, put your feet in the shoes of the President. Put yourself in the President's position. Do you think he thought when he was on the call it was him and, and President Zelensky he was talking to and that was it? Or it was, as sometimes I heard one commentator said, it was people listening in on the call, the President and 3,000 of his closest friends. Let's be realistic. The President of the United States knew when he was on that call there were a lot of people listening. From our side and from their side. So he knew what he was saying. He said it. We released a transcript of it. The facts on the call that have been kind of the focus of all of this really focused on foreign policy initiatives both in Ukraine and around the globe. They talked about other countries and other countries. The president has been very concerned about other countries carrying some of the financial load here, not just the United States. That's a legitimate position for a president to take. If you disagree with it, you have the right to do that. But he is the president. As my colleague, Deputy White House Counsel Philbin, just said, that's the executive branch prerogative. That is their constitutional appropriate role. So the call is well documented. There were lots of people on the call. The person that would be on the other end of the quid pro quo, if it existed, would have been President Zelensky. But President Zelensky, and we already laid out the other officials from Ukraine, have repeatedly said there was no pressure. It was a good call. They didn't even know there was a pause in the aid. All of that is well documented. I'm not going to go through each and every one of those facts. We did that over the last several days. President Zelensky's senior advisor, Andrei Yermak, was asked if he ever felt there was a connection between military aid and the request for investigations. And he was adamant that we never had that feeling and we did not have the feeling that this aid was connected to any one specific issue. This is coming from the people who were receiving the aid. So we talk about this whole quid pro quo. And that was a big issue. That's how this actually, before it became a impeachment proceeding, there was, as the proceedings were beginning in the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence under Chairman Schiff's role, there was all these discussions. Is it a quid pro quo? Was it, was it extortion? Was it bribery? What was it? And we are clear in our position that there was no quid pro quo. But then yesterday, my co-counsel, Professor Alan Dershowitz, explained last night 
that these articles must be rejected. He's talking about from a constitutional framework. Even if there was a quid pro quo, which we have clearly established there was not. And this is what he said, and I'm going to quote it verbatim. The claim that foreign policy decisions can be deemed abuses of power based on subjective opinions about mixed or sole motives that the president was interested only in helping himself demonstrate the dangers of employing the vague, subjective, and politically malleable phrase abuse of power as a constitutionally permissible criteria for the removal of a president. He went on to say, now it follows from this that if a president, any president, were to have done what the Times reported about the content of John Bolton's manuscript that would not constitute an impeachable offense. I'm quoting exactly from Professor Dershowitz. He says, let me repeat it. Nothing in the Bolton revelations, even if true, even if true, would rise to the level of abuse of power or an impeachable offense. That is clear from history. That is clear from the language of the Constitution. You cannot turn conduct that is not impeachable into impeachable conduct simply by using words like quid pro quo and personal benefit. It is inconceivable that the framers would have intended to so politically loaded and promiscuously deployed a term as abuse of power to be weaponized, again, Professor Dershowitz, as a tool of, a tool of impeachment. It is precisely the kind of vague, open-ended, and subjective term the founders and the framers feared and rejected. Now, to be specific, you cannot impeach a president on an unsourced allegation. But what Professor Dershowitz was saying, even if everything in there was true, it constitutionally doesn't rise to that level. But I want to be clear on this, because there's a lot of speculation out there. With regard to what John Bolton has said, which referenced a number of individuals, we'll start with the president. Here's what the president said in response to that New York Times piece. I never told John Bolton that the aid to Ukraine was tied to investigations into Democrats, including the Bidens. In fact, he never complained about this at the time of his very public termination. If John Bolton said this, it was only to sell a book. The Department of Justice. While the Department of Justice has not reviewed Mr. Bolton's manuscript, the New York Times account of his conversation grossly mischaracterizes what Attorney General Barr and Bolton discussed. There was no discussion of personal favors or undue influence on investigations, nor did the Attorney General state that the President's conversations with foreign leaders were improper. The Vice President's Chief of Staff issued a statement. In every conversation with the President and the Vice President, in preparation for our trip to Poland, remember that was the trip that was being planned for the meeting with President Zelensky, the President consistent, consistently expressed his frustration that the United States was bearing the lion's share of responsibility for aid to Ukraine and that European nations weren't doing their part. The President also expressed concerns about corruption in Ukraine, and at no time did I hear him tie Ukraine aid to investigations into the Biden family or Burisma. That was the response. Responding to an unpublished manuscript that maybe some reporters have an idea of maybe what it says. I mean, that's what, I mean, that's what the evidence, if you want to call that evidence, I don't know what you'd call that. I'd call it inadmissible, but that's what it is. To argue that the president is not acting in our national interest and is violating his oath of office, which the managers have put forward, is wrong based on the facts and by the way the Constitution is designed. And when you look at the fullness of the record of their witnesses, their witnesses, the witnesses' statements, the transcripts, there's one thing that emerges. 
There is no violation of law. There's no violation of the Constitution. There is a disagreement on policy decisions. Most of those that spoke at your hearings did not like the president's policy. That's why we have elections. That's what policy differentials and differences are discussed. But to have, have a removal of a duly elected president based on a policy disagreement? That is not what the framers intended. And if you lower the bar that way, danger, danger, danger. Because the next president, or the one after that, he or she will be held to that same standard? I hope not. I pray not that that's not what happens. Not just for the sake of, of my client, but for the Constitution. You know, Professor Dershowitz gave a list of presidents from Washington to where we are today who under that standard that they are proposing could be subject to abuse of power or obstruction of Congress. Look, we, we, we know that what this is is not about a president pausing aid to Ukraine. It's really not about a phone call. It's about a lot of attempts on policy disagreements that are not being debated here. My goodness, how much time? How much time has been spent in the House of Representatives Hoping, they were hoping, that the Mueller probe would result in, I mean, I'm not going to play you, I was thinking about it, playing all the clips from all the commentators the day after, the day after the, Bob Mueller testified. Bob Mueller was unable to answer under his examination basic and fundamental questions. He had to correct himself, actually. He had to correct himself before the Senate for something he said before the House. So that's what the president's been living with. And then we're here today arguing about what? A phone call to Ukraine? Or Ukraine aid being held? Or a question about corruption? Or a question about corruption that happens to involve a high public profile figure? I mean, is that what this is? Is that where we are? And then what do we find out? The aid was released. It was released in an orderly fashion. The reform president, President Zelensky, wins, but there was a question whether his party would take the parliament. It did. They worked late into the evening with the desire to put forward reforms. So everybody was waiting, including, and you heard the testimony from, I will say, their witnesses. You heard the testimony. Everybody was concerned about Ukraine. Everybody was concerned about whether these reforms could actually take place. Everybody was concerned about it. So you hold back. Didn't affect anything that was going on in the field. We heard Mr. Crow worrying about the soldiers. I understand that. I appreciate that. But none of that aid was affecting what was going on on the battlefield right then or for the next four months because it was future aid. And are we having an impeachment proceeding because aid came out three weeks before the end of the fiscal year? Or a six-minute phone call? You boil it down, that's what this is. It's interesting to me that Everybody's saying, well, the aid was finally released September 11th, only because of, of the committee and the whistleblower who we've never seen. Mr. Philbin dealt with that in great detail. I'm not going to go over that again. But you know, the new high court, the anti-corruption court, wasn't established and did not sit until September 5th, 2019. 
So while the president of Ukraine was trying to get reforms put in place, the court that was going to decide corruption issues was not set until September 5th. I want, you, I want you to think about this for a moment, too. They needed a high court of corruption for corruption. I mean, think about that for a moment. Now, that's good that they recognized it. But remember when I said the other day, you, you, you don't make wave a magic wand and now Ukraine doesn't have a corruption problem? The high court of corruption, which they have to have, because it's not just past corruption. They're concerned about ongoing corruption issues. And you could put all of your witnesses back on the, under oath in the next hearings you'll have when this is all over. And you're going to be back in the house and we'll be doing this again. Put them all back under oath and ask them, Mr. Schiff, is there a problem of corruption in Ukraine? And if they get up there and say, no, everything is great now, hallelujah. But I suspect they're going to say, we're working really hard on it. And I, and I believe them. But this idea that it was just vanished and now we're back into everything's fine. It's, it's absurd. Mr. Morrison testified that while the developments were taking place, the vice president also met with President Zelensky in Warsaw. That was the meeting of September 1st. The one, by the way, where the vice president's office said, in response to this New York Times, nobody told him about aid being held or linked to investigations. Are you going to stop? Are you going to allow proce proceedings on impeachment to go from a New York Times report about someone that says what they hear is in a manuscript? Is that where we are? I don't think so. I hope not. What did Marson say? He heard firsthand that the new Ukraine administration was taking concrete steps to address corruption. That's good. He advised the president that the relationship with Zelensky is one that could be trusted. Good. President Zelensky also agreed with Vice President Pence, this is interesting, that the Europeans should be doing more. And related to Vice President Pence, conversations he'd been having with European leaders about getting them to do more. In sum, the president raised two issues he was concerned with to get them addressed. Now, I've already went over, again, this is just the closing moments here of this proceeding, of our portion of this proceeding. Aid was withheld, were paused, put on a pause button. Not just for Ukraine. Afghanistan, South Korea, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Lebanon, and Pakistan, and I'm sure I am leaving countries out. But do you think the American people are concerned if the president says, you know, before we give a country, I don't know, $550 million, some countries only $400 million, We'd like to know what they're doing with it. You're supposed to be the guardians of the trust here. It's the taxpayers' money we're spending. There was a lot of testimony from, from uh, Dr. Fiona Hill, John Bolton's deputy. Here's what she said about aid that was being held. This is her testimony. There was a free put, freeze put on all kinds of aid and assistance because it was in the process at the time of an awful lot of reviews of foreign assistance. Oh, you mean there was a policy within the administration to review foreign assistance and how we're doing it because we spend a lot of money. And by the way, I'm not complaining about the money. I don't think anybody doesn't want to help. But we do need to know what's going on. And those are valid and important questions. Manager Crow told you that president, uh, the president's Ukraine policy was not strong against Russia. But Ambassador Yovanovitch stated the exact opposite. She said in her deposition that our country's Ukraine policy under President Trump, actually, her words, got stronger than it was under President Obama. So again, policy disagreements, disagreements on approach, 
have elections. That's what we do in our republic. For three long days, House managers presented their case by selectively showing parts of testimony. Good lawyers show parts of testimony. You don't have to show the whole thing. But other good lawyers show the rest of the testimony. And that's what we sought to do, to give you a fuller view of what we saw as the glaring omissions by my colleagues, the House managers. The legal issues here are the constitutional ones. And I have been, um, I think, pretty clear over the last week, starting when we had the motions arguments, that my concern about the constitutional obligations that we're operating under. I have been critical of Manager Nadler's executive privilege and other nonsense. We, I want you to look at it this way. Take out executive privilege. First Amendment free speech and other nonsense. The free exercise of religion and other nonsense. The rights to due process and other nonsense. The rights to equal protection under the laws and other nonsense. You can't start doing that. You would not do that. No administration has done that. In fact, since the first administration, George Washington, they wanted information, he thought it was privilege, he said it was executive privilege. But let's not start calling constitutional rights other nonsense, lumping them together. Of course, this is from, from a House of Representatives that actually believes the attorney-client privilege doesn't apply, which should scare every lawyer in Washington, D.C. But more, more scary to the lawyers would be for their clients. They say that in writing, in letters. They don't hide it. I would ask them, I don't, I'm not going to, it's not my privilege to do that, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that the attorney-client privilege does not apply in a congressional hearing? Do you really believe that? Because then if it doesn't apply, then there is no attorney-client privilege. Or is that the attorney-client privilege and other nonsense? Danger, danger, danger. We believe that Article I fails constitutionally. The President has constitutional authority to engage and conduct foreign policy and foreign affairs. It is our position, legally, the President at all times acted with perfect legal authority, inquired of matters in our national interest, and re having received assurances of those matters, continued his policy that his administration put forward of what really is unprecedented support for Ukraine, including the delivery of military aid package that was denied to the Ukrainians by prior administrations. You know, some sitting, some of the managers right here, my colleagues at the other table, voted in favor of those, wanted Javelin anti-tank missiles for Ukraine. Some of the members here did not. Didn't want to do that. Voted against that. I'm glad we gave it to them. I'm glad we allowed them to purchase javelins. I tell you, I never served in the military. I have tremendous, tremendous respect for the men and women that protect our freedom each and every day. I, tremendous respect for what they are doing and continue to do. But this president actually allowed the javelins to go. Some of you liked that idea, some of you did not. It's policy difference. Were you going to impeach President Obama because he did not give them lethal aid? No. Nor should have you. You should not do that. It's a policy difference. Policy difference do not rise to the level of constitutionally mandated or constitutional applications for removal from office. It is policy 
differences. By the way, it's not just on lethal weapons. And President Obama, as I said, withheld aid. He had the right to do that. You've allowed him to do that. Oh, but we don't like that this president did it. So the rules change. So this president's rules are different than, he, he has a different set of standards he has to apply than what you allowed the previous administration to apply. And you know what? Or the future administration to apply. That's the problem with these articles. We've laid out, I believe, a compelling case on what the Constitution requires. When they were in the House of Representatives, putting this together, did they go through a constitutionally mandated accommodations process to see if there was a way to come up with something? No, they did not. Did they run to court? No. And the one time it was about to happen, they ran the other way. Separation of powers means something. It's not separation of powers and other nonsense. If we've reached now, at this very moment, in the history of our republic, a bar of impeachment because you don't like the president's policies or you don't like the way he undertook those policies, because we hear a lot about policies. If partisan impeachment is now the rule of the day, which these members and members of this Senate said should never be the rule of the day. My goodness, they said it, some of them, five months ago. But then we had the national emergency. A phone call. It's an emergency. Except we'll just wait. But if partisan impeachment based on policy disagreements, which is what this is, and personal presumptions, or newspaper reports and allegations in a unsourced, maybe this is in somebody's book, who's no longer at the White House. If that becomes the new norm. Future presidents, Democrats, Republicans, will be paralyzed the moment they are elected. Before they can even take the oath of office. The bar for impeachment cannot be set this low. Majority Leader McConnell, Democratic Leader Schumer, House Managers, members of the Senate. Danger, danger, danger. These articles must be rejected. The Constitution requires it. Justice demands it. Majority Leader, we would ask for a short recess if we can. About 15 minutes. The Majority Leader is recognized. We'll be in uh, recess for 15, 15 minutes. Without objection. Presidential attorney uh, Jay Sekulow with a, an impassioned defense of the president and essentially boiling it down to saying this whole thing was a policy dispute and that the president acted at all times within uh, his power. That, of course, uh, all the, the, his team also addressing the big elephant in the room, which we've all been talking about, and that's what's in John Bolton's manuscript of his book that has yet to be released. Uh, let me begin our coverage. Uh, Chuck Todd right now is in our Washington newsroom. Chuck, uh, early yesterday, that was something they didn't want to address. Today, no. it, it came up. It came up last night with Alan Dershowitz as well. It did. It felt like Jay Sekulow's job today was almost pleading, begging um, Republican senators not to ask for Bolton's testimony. I mean, he was so dismissive, but yet kept talking about it, which tells you they seem to be nervous that they're losing this argument. I wrote down a few of the statements he said. It's perhaps maybe, maybe it's in someone's book. Or, uh, and, and this is, are we really going to impeach somebody based on an 
on an excerpt in the New York Times. It was it was almost begging, screaming, yelling at those Republican senators, don't do this, bolt, don't go down this Bolton Road. And the question I have is, was it effective or was there a point it came across as almost you doth protest too much? You know, what are you afraid of here? At the end of the day, if your argument is this doesn't meet um, an impeachment standard, that even if you look at everything the Democrats allege, even if you take what Bolton said, so if that is their stance, then at the end of the day, why are they afraid of Bolton testimony? That was what struck me. It was that they kept, he kept coming back to it. He kept sounding alarmist. It, it, it seemed to me it was just masked in fear of Bolton, uh, fear of this Bolton testimony. Does this have the, the sense of something that there were some very serious discussions and hand-wringing over? It certainly feels like it to me. I mean, the fact that we went from, as you noted yesterday, Lester, one mentioned by Alan Dershowitz, to essentially Jay Sekulow's job was to make the don't call John Bolton defense argument, right? That I think ultimately that is what that was designed to be. It could work. I mean, that's the thing. I, I'm not going to sit here and presume. It, there might be some, though, that hear, wow, that's aggressively uh, nervous about Bolton. Why? Right. Like there's there's going to be two ways some people may interpret Mr. Sekulow's uh, passion in this argument. Let me turn to Andrea Mitchell. Uh, let's talk about John Bolton for a minute, his credibility. Uh, we saw, you know, General Kelly got behind him and basically said, right. if he said this, then I believe it. But how will that play? A lot of these senators know him well. Um, and the White House already trying to dismiss his credibility. Well, Rand Paul has come out against him, but that's that goes back to foreign policy issues. Rand Paul is not an interventionist and not a hawk on foreign policy the way John Bolton is. So they've had a lot of disputes in the past, but others are very strongly aligned with John Bolton. He is a very conservative Republican, very familiar face on Fox News. That's one of the reasons why he was brought into the Trump White House. And he's got a lot of support in that Republican caucus. I think that over lunch today, before they went on, uh, on into the chamber at one o'clock, I think there was a lot of disagreement and discussion among the Republican senators. We began to see it yesterday. And you heard that yesterday, Pat Toomey, very close to Mitch McConnell from Pennsylvania, a conservative Republican saying, why not open it up to witnesses? He also talked about the, the trade, the swap, that's still to be negotiated. But I think there is an emerging, what some are calling the Collins Amendment, Susan Collins Amendment, which would allow witnesses and documents and still to be defined as whether there would be the Hunter Biden piece of this. But I think that there's a lot more pressure for witnesses now, and that's why you saw him uh, being, Sekulow, right. being so aggressive today. And, and Barrett Berger, our NBC News analyst, uh, we, we talked about at the beginning of this that there's this fail-safe plan, which is that if all of this happened, then it still doesn't rise to the level of impeachment. He made a very, uh, Jay Sekulow made a very impassioned argument on that. How did it go over? Well, it'll be interesting to see how that lands, but, but you really saw them stressing, as you mentioned earlier, this policy thing. I, I, he must have said the word policy 20 times during his presentation. I think that is their tagline for all of this. This is not a criminal act. It's not an impeachable act. These are policy differences. This is a political fight. I think they're going to keep repeating that. And whether or not it has appeal to the senators, I can see it having appeal to the public. I can see people seeing that and really, without necessarily understanding all the facts behind it, buying into the fact that this is just Democrats putting up a fight about policy matters. And during this uh, short break, uh, Senator Mike Braun has, uh, has graciously agreed to come on with us for a few moments. Senator, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Hey, good to be on. Give me a sense of, of what the appetite is in your caucus right now for allowing uh, witnesses, specifically uh, John Bolton. So I think uh, with that news breaking Sunday evening, of course, everybody's been digesting that. But I go back to uh, you're probably in one of two places. Uh, you're either at this point searching for more information to kind of give you that differential uh, bit of uh, information that's going to put you over the hump. If you're still debating with the foundation of how it arose are the merits of the case. So, and I think probably just a few on each side and maybe a few more on the Republican side. Uh, but we really uh, knew we were going to come to witnesses one way or the other on Friday, and it looks like that's when it's going to happen. And whether you need it at this point, here's where I'm coming from. 
and it goes to the foundation of how we got started. The part of the argument that's resonated most with me would be, did it make sense from its origination? And when it came uh, over in a purely partisan way, uh, when it was talked about so early before we knew what might happen to impeach the president, upending an election and then preventing another one, those big picture issues are more important to someone like me. When it comes to the evidence, they've got a lot that's circumstantial, regardless of what might happen with Bolton. Of course, Dershowitz said that that particular piece clearly didn't rise to the level of impeachment. Is, is that your, two your, articles. Is that your position it, as well? You know, it would be because I think when you do this, and I think down the road, when historians look at this, and as divided as we are as a country, we probably need to figure out how we've gotten into this predicament twice in 20 years, and to where it's been basically partisan when the end result is going to be uh, uh, meted out. So I think that that is going to be the bigger issue for anyone still grappling with the details of the case. Uh, I think that's why you have discussion, you have questions tomorrow and uh, the next day, and then we'll arrive at the crossroads of witnesses on Friday. Do, do you agree with the defense position that the president did absolutely nothing wrong, that everything he did was within his right as president? I've been a Trump supporter for the agenda. I've come here to work on health care, first guy to join the Climate Caucus, I think it's a big deal. When it comes to the president's behavior and his style, we knew what we were getting there. He is the embodiment of frustration with business as usual around here. I think Bernie Sanders reflects that on the other side. That's another big picture takeaway. So I'm, my style is different. I love the agenda. And you know, I think as we go forward, anyone here ought to be careful in a hot political environment like this. I remember what it was like recently coming through an election, negative advertising, when I thought it came from a fairly wholesome, simple background. And nothing's like that anymore here when you get to the national level. Let me bring in, if I can, my colleague uh, Chuck Todd, who, Senator, I think has a question for you. Chuck? Hey, Senator, let me ask this, because you were, I thought, uh, very forthcoming on Sunday with me when you said, look, you got to, politics does play a role here. What your constituents believe plays a role here. If you believe the House acted in a way that you thought was not healthy for the process, do you think it's incumbent upon the Senate then to go above and beyond? It's sort of similar to a question I asked you before. The, you, know, you know where this is headed, but maybe it's important for the country that the Senate looks like, well, look, the president didn't want witnesses. They did. We went ahead and did it. He's acquitted, but it, it raises the institution up. It elevates the institution. How much of that sentiment is inside your Republican conference? So I think when we discussed it on Sunday, I told you that was a tricky combination of right. each senator's state, what they want you to do back there, and each senator's conscience. And I think when you combine the two of them, you get to a point where this is not a difficult decision. And I think, let's look at the other side of the aisle. I don't know that anyone is wavering. And I think when you look at some of the races that we've got, some of the people that have expressed their opinions, they are grappling with that. And I honestly don't think any one of them has really gotten crystallized on where right. they're at. And I know it's a tough decision for them and I respect it. I think it's so few on each side, it goes back to what I said earlier. How can we be in a place like this as a country Our, right. where we've got so much to do and we're so polarized? I guess the question is this. What's the outcome? It's not a healthy outcome to me if, on one hand, the House, you believe, the House looks like it acted in a partisan way, and then if the Senate ends up looking like it's acting in a partisan way. How do you prevent that outcome? I think when you look at the technicality of it, all that heavy lifting should have been done over there to where we maybe had an easier case to sort out. If you look at it as witnesses being that next marginal thing you need to do to have fairness, do a better mm -hmm. job than the House, you emphasize that. And I think that's what every individual is grappling with that's now not in a place where they know what they want to do. Yeah. Well, Senator uh, Mike Braun, I, I know it's a short break. We always appreciate you taking time for us. Thank you, sir. You bet. All right. I want to bring in uh, Pete Williams right now, our justice correspondent. Pete, we heard uh, 
Jay Sekulow, during that final stretch, really kind of go down the list of grievances regarding the Mueller investigation, regarding the, the findings of the Horowitz report. Uh, you were watching along with that. What was your take? I don't see what that has to do with the charge. I guess Jay Sekulow was saying, look at the kind of people who have been beating up on the president. It ain't fair. But, the, but none of that has to do with the, with the claim that's in the, the two impeachment counts here that came from the House, all stemming from the, the phone call. The House decided not to include any material saying that he had, had obstructed justice in the Mueller investigation. So I, I, I guess you could chalk that up to sort of uh, trying to, to say, look, look at the, uh, the problems this president has had. Lester, if I could just raise one other point sure. here. If uh, you know, two things may happen. The Senate may ask John Bolton to testify or, and there's some talk about this apparently now, senators may try to get their hands on the book manuscript. I think, uh, you know, <laughs> admittedly, a legal no man's land, no matter what happens here from here on, because this has never happened before. But if the Senate tries to subpoena John Bolton, who said he would testify, and the White House tries to stop that, I think, they would ha I think the White House would have a hard time legally preventing his testimony on executive privilege grounds. If the Senate Im uh, subpoenas the manuscript of his book, um, you can imagine that the publisher would resist that because if, the, if this thing becomes public and it shows up on the Internet somewhere, the value of the book goes to zero pretty fast. But the legal experts I've talked to say it might be very hard for the publisher to fight that in court and stop the Senate from getting its hands on the manuscript. So two possible outcomes. Again, admittedly, nobody knows exactly how this would end up. All right, Pete, thanks very much. Let's go to Casey Hunt right now at the Capitol with some new reporting. Casey. Lester, uh, it does seem as though uh, something is up, quite frankly. Uh, Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski were huddling on the floor for five plus minutes as the break uh, just began. They were covering their mouths, trying to shield what they were saying uh, from reporters. This sort of coming as the conversation around whether or not to call witnesses has become more heated. And quite frankly, speculation has increased uh, that the White House may not be able to prevent uh, the calling of witnesses here uh, in this trial, which obviously would extend it by weeks. We want to emphasize we don't you know, have anything to def definitive to report at this point, but Murkowski and Collins are two of the key players in this overall. Uh, and as Pete was just talking about, uh, the, the interest in what is in this manuscript, what John Bolton has to say, is pretty intense here at the Capitol. There are you know, a couple ways they could go about this, a couple things that have been floated here. Senator Lankford was floating the idea of putting the manuscript in the secure room here at the Capitol where people could potentially review it. Senator Lindsey Graham seemed to say that he might be on board with that idea. Others have been more circumspect about that. But either way, whether it's introducing new information in the case of a manuscript, that would be new evidence or adding John Bolton as a witness uh, would require uh, the Senate to vote to do that, to bring that into the record here uh, either way that they decided to. And uh, that, of course, the critical question for the White House. They have been trying uh, to, of course, keep this trial to uh, as limited as possible, to get a quick acquittal for the president, perhaps even uh, ahead of the State of the Union that's coming up scheduled for next Tuesday. Uh, right now, I have to say, as we, you know, we are tracking this minute to minute here in the building, but it seems uh, likelier than ever that th there is a possibility that this trial will extend. And again, uh, we do want to underscore, we don't know anything definitive yet, but even just listening to your conversation there with Senator Braun, uh, he, and, and I think Chuck uh, Todd spoke to him as well on Sunday uh, and has been paying close attention. To me, it did not sound as though uh, he is as uh, firmly pushing back against this witness question as he had been previously, I think perhaps reflecting yeah. some of the change in tenor we've heard here. Like. Well, let's get a little bit more read on this uh, question. Uh, Casey, thanks. We have Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer standing by at the Capitol. Senator, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Nice so to what, talk to you. What is your read right now on the appetite uh, for allowing witness testimony and, and, and other evidence? Well, of course, our side is totally unified on this. All 47 of us strongly feel we need the four witnesses and the four sets of documents we've asked for, all of them contemporaneous eyewitness accounts of what happened. And Seculo sort of makes the case for us, the president's lawyer. He talks over and over again, how can we rely on a newspaper report from some reporter that's third-hand hearsay? Well, 
You don't have to, Mr. Seculo. You don't have to, Donald Trump. Just let us have witnesses and you'll get direct testimony. But we know they're afraid of that. Do you envision the Republicans all the witnesses are in disarray? Uh, uh, go ahead. Do you envision uh, all the witnesses on your list or are you willing to wheel and deal uh, with, with Republicans these, to get look, John Bolton as your star witness? From the beginning, we have said we need the truth. This is serious stuff. It's solemn. It's profound. These four witnesses, I think Mulvaney is probably more important than Bolton. He was, seems to be the chief cook and bottle washer of this scheme. We need these four witnesses and these sets of documents. We can do them quickly. We're not trying to be dilatory. We haven't had a huge long list, but we need them all. What are you willing We're to give up to get them? Pardon? What we are you don't willing to give to... up? Well, the bottom line is we will, we will be able to require votes if the Republicans don't vote to shut down and say have no witness, no documents. We'll get votes on these and we'll see, see where things go. But the public, here's the thing on our side. The public is overwhelmingly for witnesses and documents and the sentiment grows stronger every day. There's a new revelation. It's almost in this way like Watergate, drip, drip, drip. And our Republican senators realize that if they vote to shut down this trial, to not have witnesses and documents when they are so essential and the case is made not only by the president's, uh, the House managers, but by the president's people in their inability to uh, deal with this issue, um, that they're going to be against their constituencies very strongly and what are, the American are, people are, want. Are there any conversations going on right now between you and the other leadership and, and, and McConnell's group? Uh, no, you know, the reason we went on a quest for truth, for witnesses and documents, is because I tried to talk to Leader McConnell and said, how can we work something out here? He then, he wouldn't uh, say, he said he wanted no witnesses or documents. And then, as you remember, he went on Sean Hannity's show and he said he's going to do just what the president wants. Well, the president wants to shut this down. He wants to shut it down as quickly as possible because he's afraid of the truth. Senator uh, Chuck Todd is with us. I think he's got a question Hi, for Chuck. you. How you doing, Senator? Uh, the the question period, which begins, it looks like, I guess, tomorrow, not uh, yes. since you guys aren't extending the session today. Um, Senator Stabenow said to me this morning that I guess they submit them to you. You're organizing them. Explain what your philosophy is on, on yeah. what you're Look, what, have, how you want this questioning to work. Yeah, we want the questions to get at the fact, the need for the facts, the need for witnesses and documents. So it's going to be about witnesses. To allow, okay. and not only, and to okay. allow the House managers to rebut the so many holes in the president's argument. They've been on for three days. Their arguments have gone unrebutted in the chamber, not mm -hmm. afterwards. We've rebutted them pretty well. I mean, Seculo today, again. He talks about the letter and says it was a policy disagreement, not once mentioning that the president mentions in the letter Hunter, Biden and CrowdStrike. That's not a policy difference. And he doesn't even mention it there. They are so fearful of the actual facts that they run away. So that's the House managers are going to have a chance to answer those. I am not trying to censure anybody. We have hundreds okay. of questions. What we will do is simply put make sure there are no duplicates. We don't want yep. the same question 10 times and put them in some degree of, of order. But otherwise, it's going to be the members, our members, who ask these yeah. questions. But I'm sure some are, of them are, will give the, chan the managers to re a chance to rebut the so many fallacies in the president's lawyers' arguments. I'm curious what you make of um, the president's, uh, I guess, wish list or whatever about his hope that he can uh, convince Joe Manchin to acquit him. Well, look, I mean, Joe Manchin has been as strong as anybody on the need for witnesses and documents. Each member is going to make up his own mind. But to me, the House managers made an extremely powerful case. I'm waiting to make up a final decision till I hear the whole rest. But the presidents, they were just interested in diversions. Hours yesterday on Hunter Biden, who had nothing to do with uh, what happened. And in fact, it shows that the president's obsession with Hunter Biden not only endangers our national security and our elections, but now even the solemnity of a trial. They had some guy get up there and make a campaign speech. It was uh, ridiculous. All right, Senator, so, you know, yeah. you please finish your thought. Nope, that's okay. Go All ahead. right. Well, I just want to say thank you for taking some time. So to I'm going to. So us. what I'm, I, you know, what I am saying is the, pre, the the Republicans can call whatever witnesses they want. They have the majority. 
I think a lot of them don't want to call Hunter Biden because they know it would make it a circus. They don't want to call the president's list. But our focus is not in trading and not in saying this for that, but in getting the small number of witnesses who were witness to what happened, get the truth. And just one final point. We don't know what these witnesses will say, and they're clearly not Democratic plants. They're the president's appointees. They may be exculpatory and, uh, for the president. They may be further uh, incriminating, but we need the truth. That's what we hey, stood Senator, for, and that's why the American people are with us. Senator Schumer, are we ever going to have the president under oath? Bill Clinton was under oath. Richard Nixon, after the fact, went under oath with the grand jury. Is well, Donald Trump ever going to be under oath on this? Is he going to be a yeah. witness you call? Ask him. He won't even let the people around him testify. This has been the most massive obstruction, absolute Can't you uh, call obstruction him? that we've ever no. had. Well, I, you know, we'd have to check the law and all of that. But if he wanted to come, he, I'm sure that his own lawyers would let him come. All right, Senator, <laughs> thanks so much. Good to talk to you, sir. Thanks. All right, All right. let me bring in uh, Hallie Jackson out of the White House, who has some new reporting as well. Hallie. Hey, Lester. So a couple of things here. And in the conversation that you're having with Senator Schumer, Senator Braun, Casey and Chuck and others about witnesses, I can tell you that the sense here inside the White House is, frankly, less confidence that this is going to go the way that they necessarily would like it to go, and certainly less confidence after the Bolton book revelations that came out when you compare sort of the mood around the White House and the West Wing and sources that I've talked to then versus now. There is an acknowledgement that the Bolton revelations obviously changed the game. There's a lot of watching to see, uh, as Casey knows and is reporting on Capitol Hill, where that sort of count ends up uh, and where the vote on witnesses goes, but also on the Senate Q&A portion, the, the part where the senators are able to ask these written questions for about 16 hours. It's going to happen once Pat Cipollone, uh, after the break here, essentially rests the defense team's opening arguments. There's also uh, the, the piece on what that Senate Q&A may look like. And I can tell you that a source close to the legal team is, is telling me that the, white, the president's lawyers are preparing for questions that they think will be somewhat predictable from Democrats, but they want to be ready for any curveballs as it may relate to the facts of the matter there. Uh, and they're also looking for Republicans or thinking that Republicans will ask questions that will help the defense team provide greater clarity, I'm told, of areas of interest for some of the senators on the Republican side who are in the chamber as well. Uh, I'll also th say this. We've been talking about the president's defense team, the arguments that they are putting on now. You heard Jay Sekulow just before the break, Lester, mention Alan Dershowitz, the constitutional attorney, of course, who gave that presentation uh, late yesterday. I had a chance <coughs> to speak with Professor Dershowitz today, who told me that the president called him up this morning. They had what Dershowitz described as a long talk. He wouldn't get specific about what, what exactly they talked about, but seemed to indicate that it went well, that the president seemed pleased uh, and thought that he himself thought it went okay yesterday, although he was here for a separate event, Lester, on the president's unveiling of the Middle East peace plan, and, and uh, perhaps understandably in the East Room today wanted to talk more about that than the impeachment trial that is happening, of course, simultaneously to this, Lester. All right. Andrea Mitchell here with us has been uh, working her sources. What's, what's the sense of, uh, of Speaker, uh, I'm sorry, Leader McConnell's hold on his caucus right now in general? I think it is not as not as whole, firm a hold as it had been. As when he walked think, in with this. And absolutely. Yeah. I think that the last 24, 48 hours, really, since the Bolton book came out, has really shaken the Republican caucus. You've got, as Casey was saying, Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski huddling on the floor. They're clearly trying to find some sort of way to get to witnesses, to get some sort of political cover for Collins and for others in the Republican caucus who are finding it increasingly difficult to say, why shouldn't we have firsthand testimony when the defense lawyers are saying it's all hearsay, the House case doesn't hold up, well, bring in the witnesses. It's really a very tough argument to take. And look at the polling. Uh, the polling is clearly, those who are paying attention say, a trial should have witnesses, especially with the Bolton, the Bolton book. Yeah. Whether or not the manuscript, Pete was talking about that, and Lindsey Graham has given it some some heft in terms of, well, that could be an approach. It isn't a classified document, so to take it into the so-called skiff for reading uh, has been one of the proposals, I guess not because it's classified, but because that would pr pr possibly protect the publisher's financial interests in it not being widely exposed. But I think that that would be a, a pretty hard argument to make, that a, a book that is already being circulated and has been partially yeah. Unpublished, le leaked to the New York but Times becoming a, a, a bestseller can soon. somehow go into a classified setting All right. would, be, would and, be difficult. We're joined now by uh, Andrew Weissman, NBC News legal analyst, former uh, Department of uh, Justice prosecutor. Good to have you here. Nice to be here. Um, so talk about what happens. Let's say 
You, well, you heard you heard the uh, minority leader a moment ago saying he'd rather have uh, he thinks Mick Mulvaney is perhaps a, a more important witness. Oh, how does it work? You know, do you need to get all four to make your case, or does one? Or how do you, as a as a prosecutor, you want to weave a narrative? So there's nothing about this that's, that's totally akin to a prosecution because in a, in a prosecution, if there's a relevant witness, you call them. So the idea that you wouldn't call all four if you thought they were relevant is just not really, you, you would do it. So here it doesn't make sense that you wouldn't do it. But I think that Democrats, um, frankly, should be happy if they get Bolton because that really sets the stage. If Bolton is going to be providing evidence that implicates Pompeo, Mulvaney, Giuliani, the president, the vice president, president, at that point, it's really the, the Republicans who have to make a decision about whether they're going to want to call them. All right, we're going to take you uh, back into the uh, Senate chambers where they uh, resume. But I think, I think you've heard a lot from our side, and I think we've made our case. And so I just want to leave you with a couple of points. First of all, first of all, thank you, Mr. Leader. And thank you, Democratic Leader Schumer, and all of you for the privilege of speaking on the floor of the Senate and for your time and attention. We really appreciate it. We've made three basic points. One, all you need in this case is the Constitution and your common sense. You just look at the articles of impeachment. The articles of impeachment fall far short of any constitutional standard, and they are dangerous. And if you look to the words from the past that I think are instructive, as I said last night, they're instructive because they were right then and they're right now. And I'll leave you with some of those words. There must never be a narrowly voted impeachment or an impeachment supported by one of our major political parties and opposed by the other. Such an impeachment will produce the divisiveness and bitterness in our politics for years to come and will call into question the very legitimacy of our political institutions. This is unfair to the American people. By these actions, you would undo the free election that expressed the will of the American people in 1996. In so doing, you will damage the faith the American people have in this institution and in the American democracy. You will set the dangerous precedent that the certainty of presidential terms, which has so benefited our wonderful America, will be replaced by the partisan use of impeachment. Future presidents will face election, then litigation, then impeachment. The power of the president will diminish in the face of the Congress, a phenomenon much feared by the Founding Fathers. This is a constitutional amendment that we are debating, not an impeachment resolution. The Republicans are crossing out the impeachment standard of high crimes and misdemeanors, and they are inserting the words any crime or misdemeanor. We are permitting a constitutional, constitutional coup d'etat which will haunt this body and our country forever. I warn my colleagues that you will reap the bitter harvest of the unfair partisan seeds you sowed today. The constitutional provision for impeachment is a way to protect our government and our citizens, not another weapon in the political arsenal. I expect history will show that we've lowered the bar on impeachment so much. We have broken the seal on this extremely extreme, extreme penalty so cavalierly that it will be used as a routine tool to fight political battles. My fear is that when a Republican wins the White House, Democrats will demand payback. You were right. <laughs> but I'm sorry to say you were also prophetic. And I think I couldn't say it better myself, so I won't. You know what the right answer is in your heart. You know what the right answer is for our country. You know right, what the right answer is for the American people. What they are asking you to do is to throw out a successful president on the eve of an election with no basis and in violation of the Constitution. It would dangerously change our country and weaken, weaken 
forever, all of our democratic institutions. You all know that's not in the interest of the American people. Why not trust the American people with this decision? Why tear up their ballots? Why tear up every ballot across this country? You can't do that. You know you can't do that. So I ask you to defend our Constitution, to defend fundamental fairness, to defend basic due process rights, but most importantly, most importantly, to respect and defend the sacred right of every American to vote and to choose their president. The election is only months away. The American people are entitled to choose their president. Overturning the last election and massively interfering with the upcoming one would cause serious and lasting damage to the people of the United States and to our great country. The Senate cannot allow this to happen. It is time for this to end, here and now. So we urge the Senate to reject these articles of impeachment for all of the reasons we have given you. You know them all. I don't need to repeat them. They've repeatedly said over and over again, a quote from Benjamin Franklin, it's a republic if you can keep it. And every time I heard it, I said to myself, it's a republic if they let us keep it. And I have every confidence, every confidence in your wisdom You will do the only thing you can do, what you must do, what the Constitution compels you to do. Reject these articles of impeachment for our country and for the American people. It will show that you put the Constitution above partisanship. It will show that we can come together on both sides of the aisle and end the era of impeachment for good. You know it should end. You know it should end. It will allow you all to spend all of your energy and all of your enormous talent and all of your resources on doing what the American people sent you here to do, to work together, to work with the President, to solve their problems. So this should end now as quickly as possible. Thank you again for your attention. I look forward to answering your questions. And with that, that ends our presentation. Thank you very much. The majority leader is recognized. <clears throat> Mr. Chief Justice, I have uh, reached an agreement with the Democratic leader on how to proceed during the question period. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that the question period for senators start when the Senate reconvenes on Wednesday. Further, that the questions alternate between the majority and minority sides for up to eight hours during that session of the Senate. Finally, that on Thursday, the Senate resume time for senators <clears throat> questions alternating between sides for up to eight hours during that session of the Senate. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. So we will complete the question period over the next two days. I remind senators that their questions must be in writing, will be submitted to the Chief Justice. During the question period of the Clinton trial, Senators were thoughtful and brief with their questions, and the managers and counsel were succinct in their answers. I hope we can follow both of these examples during this time. During the impeachment trial of President Clinton, Chief Justice Rehnquist advised counsel, quote, counsel on both sides, that the chair will operate on a rebuttable presumption that each question can be fully and fairly answered in five minutes or less, end quote. 
The transcript indicates that the statement was met with, quote, laughter, end quote. <laughs> Nonetheless, managers and counsel generally limited their responses accordingly. I think the late chief's time limit was a good one and would ask both sides to abide by it. So, Mr. Chief Justice, I ask unanimous consent that the trial adjourn until 1 p.m. Wednesday, January 29th, and that this order also constitute the adjournment of the uh, Senate. Without objection, we're adjourned. An early day, the president's uh, defense not taking their allotted 24 hours. In fact, I think they had about 10 hours left on the clock, but clearly uh, after the break deciding they didn't need to push much farther. Uh, let me uh, bring back Andrew Wiseman. Was that a, a, do you think that was a late call uh, to decide to cut this off and be done with it? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think that there wasn't that much to do and the, the Bolton revelation was the kind of thing that they, they needed to figure out how they're going to deal with it. I think the next phase is going to be fascinating because even though both sides don't have the ability to ask follow-up questions in the way you would at a trial, um, both sides are going to get, get to ask really pointed questions. So for instance, with respect to the president, um, the Democrats, I would expect, are going to be asking, did the president say X, Y, and Z, tracking the New York Times report um, and really putting it um, to, the, you know, to the president's counsel to have to defend what happened, as well as being able to say, what happened? What are you saying the president will say? Um, since the president hasn't actually appeared in any form in this proceeding, not even in writing. This also gives, this also gives the Democrats a, a, really a, a chance to rebut what we've heard the last three days. Absolutely. So I think they definitely will do that. But I think I see them both rebutting. In other words, dealing with all of the sort of look at the birdie type arguments that you heard, which is distractions, and, and they can ask questions like, what's your factual basis for saying anything about the Bidens, Hunter or Joe Biden, and really saying, tell me exactly what the facts are. So I expect you'll hear that. But I, I see them really going on the offense to say, you know, let's hear exactly why the aid was withheld. Um, what was the reason for it? And then were those reasons um, did they go away in a matter of six to eight weeks? In other words, they, it's a very hard factual record for the president. And so this really gives the Democrats an opportunity to press on all of that. And I think that's going to be fascinating. All right. Uh, Hallie Jackson is, is at the White House. Hallie? Lester, I think it had been our guidance uh, and our reporting now for several days that we did not expect the president's team, even prior to the Bolton book revelations, to take up their full 24 hours. So this seemed to be about right. The question that we had had was whether or not the, the Senate Q&A would be triggered immediately after the president's defense team turned back over their time, uh, essentially, to the rest of the, the floor. And obviously, as, as our Hill team has been reporting, and as you heard from Senator Mitch McConnell there, that is now not going to start until tomorrow. So it is not unexpected that the defense team kept it short. Because remember, sources close to the team had been telling me for days they they felt like they did not need to use all 24 hours of their allotted time because, in their view, their argument was so strong they didn't have to belabor the point. You heard this publicly from Jay Sekulow repeatedly when he talked about, and from Pat Cipollone, frankly, when they talked about how they would be efficient here. They didn't want to, in their words, waste senators' time rehashing some of these arguments here. Uh, they wanted to kind of keep it a little bit crisp, and that is was their hope coming into this and now going out of this. Uh, the issue now, is, is Andrew and others are talking about, is how this Senate Q&A unfolds and then what happens with this witness vote moving forward as well. I'm also interested to see what we might hear from President Trump on this, Lester, because other than some brief comments yesterday and a series of tweets that the president has made, uh, I am eager to hear him weigh in on how he thinks his defense team did. He called Cipollone a brilliant guy, for example, his White House counsel. But the president does head to a rally later tonight. It's going to be his first big rally like this of the impeachment trial. Uh, the president will be in New Jersey. He will be in front of a supportive crowd. It is often a time, Lester, when we hear the president uh, let loose a little bit, if you will, and, and get some things off of his chest. And I imagine that given the way that the White House schedule has been these last couple of days, keeping open the afternoons, perhaps so the president can watch some of the coverage, the president may have uh, a, a line or two to say about this moving forward. Wouldn't be surprised. All right. Uh, let me go to Casey Hunt right now. Casey, talk a little bit more about this agreement between uh, 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 Senator Schumer and Senator McConnell on the rules of the road with, in terms of these questions. Uh, what's, have they talked about their strategy of, of what they want to hear in these questions? 
Well, Lester, it sounds like this was pretty amicable and is going to follow what tr what happened in the Clinton impeachment. Uh, the chamber got a laugh when uh, Justice John Roberts related how that happened. He asked both sides uh, to limit their responses to five minutes. So that's what we're going to see here. Uh, we're still kind of learning about the strategies on each side. Uh, one thing we've heard from some Republicans centers on this John Bolton question. Perhaps there are ways Republicans are thinking about that they could use their questions to try and uh, mitigate some of the, the questions around uh, the, the Bolton book and what he has to say. So uh, we're obviously watching all of that. But I have to say, Lester, the most critical piece of this could be happening starting right now, just one floor above me, where Republicans are starting to meet this afternoon to talk about this question of witnesses and whether or not they will, in fact, decide uh, to call witnesses. The politics of this, obviously, very contentious. Uh, there are uh, questions about whether uh, some of these moderate Republicans might have been changing their minds even in the last 24 hours, and uh, the speculation has been increasing that perhaps this is going to take an unexpected uh, path. But on the other hand, uh, we have uh, you know some Republican sources also saying that people like Lamar Alexander uh, don't want to be problems for Mitch McConnell. He's one of the people that we have been watching very closely. Uh, but I do think we should emphasize it's minute to minute here uh, and some of the big news uh, that that will dictate how this all unfolds uh, both over the next days and weeks, but also for the country and the, and the very course uh, of this trial uh, could be playing out right now as we speak. Lester. All right, let me turn to Chuck Todd. Chuck, talk a moment about the optics of this. If uh, witnesses are allowed and then there is an acquittal, and, right. and, and then right. if witnesses aren't allowed and there's acquittal, are Republicans potentially in a no-win here? Well, I could see they're, them thinking they're in a no-win. I happen to believe that if they're worried about their Senate majority, they need to look like, and if they're complaining the way the House behave themselves, then they can't act the same way, right? They have to be, they have to somehow be, be in, the, if they're defining being bigger as not as partisan as the House, then, then they may need to show that they are open-minded on getting more information and witnesses. But I, Andrew Weissman, I got a question for you, um, and it was similar to sort of what I asked Senator Schumer. Bill Clinton appeared under oath via videotape before the Senate trial. Like I said, Richard Nixon eventually ended up under oath after he left office. You couldn't get Donald Trump under oath during Mueller. Are you, how, is, there a, is there a reasonable way for the Senate to get the president under oath? Well, they could actually call him, but I think that one of the ways the Democrats, I think, if they're smart, um, they may realize that they'd, they're never going to get the Republicans to go along with that. So I think one strategy would be to um, really point out that all of the evidence that is unrebutted by the president, so it's really up to the president to have to come in and say something. Um, because right now, just remember, there is no evidence by the president or the vice president um, before the Senate on anything that's that's happened. They have said things publicly. They have right. had, they have had other people say things, including yesterday they had the chief of staff of the vice president. But that's sort of remarkable. I mean, you have the chief of staff of the <clears throat> vice president. You would expect that to come from the vice president or the president. Um, but clearly, you know, if you're the president of the vice president's council, you're going to be saying stay silent because you don't want to end up saying something that can be proved uh, to be false. And then what, I'm sorry, Andrew I'm Mitchell. just going to say, you know, Hallie raised a very good point about this rally tonight. Uh, every time the president goes in public, mm -hmm. especially in front of a very friendly crowd, is here it will be in South Jersey, he says something about this issue. And we are at a very delicate stage where the Republican caucus is not certain of its leadership. They're loyal to Mitch McConnell, most of them. But he was blindsided by the existence of the Bolton book and the White House clearly not telling him about it. And almost anything he says tonight could influence very delicate caucus negotiations well, it's been, and also, over witnesses. It's been awkward that he's already compromised a, a privilege. Uh, exactly. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, normally... Um, I think that, you know, even Democrats would say that the president does have a valid executive privilege at times. Um, and what he would, you know, the president might be trying to cloak this in executive privilege. There would be some issues with that. But the court doesn't need to reach that, um, given that you have the president not only making statements himself, but the chief of staff actually put in his statement that this was authorized by the president. So it is going to be very hard now to claim executive privilege. Going going forward, as we see these, I mean, 
talk about today. They've got some downtime today. Um, could we see some surprises here in oh, yes. the realignment? I, th I think the Republicans are going to be caucusing, working with some Democratic colleagues, in fact, privately. There are already talks going on. I saw it over the weekend. And they're trying to find a strategy because I don't think anyone wants to leave. Now that it's not going to easily be a quick acquittal and they're out of there, they've got to resolve this witness issue. There are too many, too many unanswered questions. All right, Andrea, thank you. And so with today's trial business, the president's defense now over. We conclude our coverage of the impeachment trial for now. The Senate back tomorrow for the Q&A of the proceedings. We'll be here to cover it all for you. Until then, for all of us at NBC News, I'm Lester Holt. Good day.